Afternoon. Come on, we're going to get one. Afternoon. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm Steve Bingham. I'm from the, the BRE Academy. Um, I, uh, the, the BRE itself uh, has been around for the last 100 years, near enough, in 2021. It's the, the Building Research Establishment. It was originally owned by the... Uh, um, by the government, and it was sold about 20 years ago for a pound, um, and it was then put into a charitable trust. Uh, and now the charity runs the BRE, uh, and there are two parts of the business, BRE Limited, and uh, which is the testing side of the business, and BRE Global, which is the certification side of the business, which you may well have used over time. So... And here's our timeline of, uh, of events within, and we're our 100th anniversary, as I say, is in 2021. Um, the, uh, the, the main parts of the BRE that you may well have heard of, around the room, probably the LPCB, um, Loss Prevention Certification Board, um, which basically tests products, probably in this room, lights and whatever have, have been, been tested through the LPCB. Yellow Jacket and Smart Waste are a... Uh, a a software tool for uh, health and safety and uh, and waste management. Sabre is all about security in buildings like uh, hospitals and uh, and hotels. <laughs> Construction excellence is, is a new part to uh, the BRE, and that is a, a membership scheme um, made up to to basically push innovation within the built environment. Um, the BRE Academy is basically the academy basically trains on everything we do at the BRE. So which is mainly BRIAM. SQL is uh, the infrastructure arm of BRIAM. Um, so BRIAM, or BREAM, if you came to the office, it's a bit like tomato, tomato. Um, they, they, they wouldn't know what you were talking about if you said BRIAM, if you came to the, uh, the BRE. Um, so it's a British Research Establishment Environmental Assessment Method. And uh, Home Quality Mark has taken over for a code for sustainable homes. Uh, we've got innovation parks. If you ever get a chance to come to Watford, please come and have a look. You can download an app and walk around the innovation park, and there's lots and lots of modern methods of construction that's, uh, that, that is there. There's one in Scotland also, one in China, one in Brazil, and one in Canada. Now, I'm obviously here to talk about BIM, um, but i just explain the drivers, the, the environmental drivers behind BIM. Um, which is a little bit ties in with BRIAM, but they are two totally separate, separate things. So the, the <coughs> Britain report basically said back that there are three main pillars um, for, for BRIAM, which is social, economic, environmental. Um, but at the, the, the core of it is sustainable development. Now, global drivers, um, as I said, social, environmental, and economic. The social drivers, um, as you see, it's all about population explosion. So 2017, the population is 7.6 billion. We're then 2030, we're going to go up to 8.6 billion. By 2050, we're going to have 9.8 billion people in the world. That's quite scary. Um, and they've got to be housed. Um, 14 out of the 15 hottest years on record have been recorded since the year 2000. Climate change is a reality. OK. Um, CO2, despite current initiatives, Global atmospheric CO2 levels are now steadily increasing, increasing the number of disaster events costing over $1 billion worldwide. So environmental drivers is by 2030, over 80 billion square metres of buildings will be built, new built and rebuilt in urban areas worldwide, an area roughly equal to 60% of the total building stock. So what we're going to do now over the next, where are we? 13 years, um, it's going to have a massive impact on going forward. This was an energy and emissions patterns being locked in for the decades to come. Stuart stole my thunder. Um, average lifespan of a building is 80 years. Um, that's, that's a massive, massive time. We've got to know what's in that building. We've got to know how, how, how it's built up so that in 80 years' time we can do something with the the products that have been taken apart and put somewhere else. And, and infrastructure is 120 years. So economical drivers. Um, this one always makes me smile. Top 25 UK contractors have an overall profit margin of below 1.5%. Yeah. 
um, there's a, a dirty word called value engineering that uh, lots of companies use when they're basically, they're, they've, they've won work by tendering for it at a very low price, under, and then they try and value engineer their way into making a profit. Carillion failed miserably. <laughs> um, and that's the main reason, is, is just that if we did more of BIM, as you see the presentation go forward, they might well have made much better profit going forward. So UK drivers is cost and carbon. They tie together quite well, but it normally comes back to cost. We have um, BRIAM rated buildings um, and we have something like 2.5 million registered projects for, uh, for BRIAM. There's only half a million of those have actually gone on to be certificated. So what happens is somebody goes, I want to be BRIAM excellent. I want to be BRIAM outstanding. And what happens is it gets value engineered to the point that they go, nah, that's pointless. We aren't doing that. We, <laughs> we, won't, we, won't, we won't go ahead with it because we can save some money. So it, yes, carbon's great, but it's always about the cost. Economic drivers. Um, UK construction output contributes to 7% of UK's GDP. Um, the sector's worth £110 billion. Commercial and social is £49 billion. Residential is £42 billion. And infrastructure is £19 billion. That'll, they'll probably move around a little bit, especially with HS2 coming and the fact the government want to build lots and lots more residential homes. Carbon. The UK is committed to 80% carbon redu reduction by 2050. That will be interesting. Um, there's obviously uh, the Paris Accord, which is uh, the latest version, and uh, Mr Trump decided he's not going to join us in that, that quest. Um, but hopefully our government is committed to it. Um, construction and operation of the built environment consumes 60% of all materials, results in 33% of all waste. Um, construction operation of buildings accounts for approximately half the UK's emissions. This is the one that gets me. Around 10% of the UK emissions are associated with the manufacture and transport materials, 13% of which is unused materials. So if we got right first time, we wouldn't be using as much materials and we certainly wouldn't be transporting as much and our CO2 emissions would be lower. So I've eventually got onto BIM. Okay, so understanding BIM, what is BIM? Well, what it isn't is it's not just a 3D CAD drawing. I had a meeting with McLaren in Dubai, and it wasn't as uh, fancy as you think. Um, and they, I said, said, do you do BIM? And they said, yes, we have, a, we have a CAD guy in the corner that does all our BIM drawings. Um, BIM's not just about a 3D CAD drawing, okay? It's not just a new technology. It's something we've already, already been doing. Um, it's not the next generation. It's here and it's now, okay? Um, this is the statement from, from BIM Talk website. BIM is essentially value created collaboration through the entire life cycle of an asset underpinned by creation, collation and exchange of shared 3D models and intelligent structured data attached to them. What a mouthful. But basically it's better information management. But on our training, we basically say you've got three types of BIM. You've got BIM, BIM and BIM. Okay. So building information model, which is what thing is produced. You've got building information modeling, how the thing is produced. And we've got building information management, who produces what thing and when. Yeah. Um, it's the bottom one is the, is, the, is the big key to BIM, in my view, um, from doing the training and from understanding it a little bit more. Um, so the model, it's a, a graphical model. It's a non-graphical model, and it's a documentation around it. The modeling, it's all about the drawings, the 3D models, the schedules, the visual data. Um, it, it's, it's producing something that you, in, in the future, will help us with the operation and maintenance of a building. Um, and then the management. You have an employer, and you have a lead supplier, um, which an employer could be, uh, can construction company, it could be a developer, um, building owner, asset owner, um, and they would basically pull up something called an EIR, um, an employer's information requirement. This sometimes happens that the, the lead supplier actually writes it for them because they don't know what one is. 
Um, so it, it's all about training. Um, the lead supplier has to then create something called a BEP or a BIM execution plan which he then sends back to the employer, this is how we're going to do what you want us to do. And it's the free flow of information back and forth. So BIM level two, there's, there's been maturity in, in BIM. We've always had building information management. It's not something that's new. It's just the fact that it, it, it's, it's increased over time. Um, and this it sort of shows you going from BIM level zero up to BIM level three. So BIM level zero is an unmanaged CAD. It's probably a 2D drawing. You've all been to, to construction sites probably and you know, you've know you got all the great massive drawings that they pull out. And um, Trouble is with that is that drawing sat there at the first day of build and we get to the end of the build and it's still the same drawing. Somebody hasn't updated it. And that's where issues happen. BIM level one, managed CAD. Sometimes in 3D, woohoo, um, using common data environment, which I'll go on to, and possibly some standard data structures, formats, um, you know, file naming conventions, maybe. Um, but it's probably their own file naming conventions and not somebody else's. BIM level two, it, this is where we're aiming for. And a lot of companies have, have, have taken to this, a lot of large, um, large, large blue chip contractors. Um, we've got uh, Kia. Um, Wilmot Dixon, um, BAM, Nuttall uh, are really committed to, to BIM level two. Where it falls down is is either the architects aren't fully into it or the normally it's the subcontractors the other end aren't into it. They, they don't understand it. Um, so it is all about training, making people aware. So then we've got BIM level three. We're way off this. Um, <laughs> The, the idea is to make it fully open process, data integration between everybody um, until the, the lower ends join the party. We're, we're, we're going to be way off this mark. But if we can get somewhere in the middle, we'll, we'll, we'll be on a, on a big plus. So BIM and sustainable construction. So although BIM cannot be seen as being essential to resource efficiency, incorporating sustainability planning and management into BIM implementation is a rational choice because the BIM process and data can be used directly to achieve efficiencies and also help estimate performance and identify biggest opportunities to save money and carbon. That basically is what we think BIM is or the, the area that BIM is most essential, the design and the construction stage, because we can create a 3D model, everybody can use it, you get less problems with it. Um, but essentially, where it works is in a full, the outcome at the end of it, a complete capex. The fact that when you get to the other end of it, you're in the O&M side, and you know what's where, when, how. Um, and what's been used. I used the analogy yesterday, you've got lights, lots of different light fittings around this room. <coughs> you used to get to the point where the FM company will send their little man out and he's got his bulbs in his pocket and you go to the light, and he'll take out the light fitting and realise, damn, it's the wrong light. Um, <laughs> I've got to go back, I've got to order that light, I've got time it's got to take. The FM companies are actually pushing against it a little bit because they like the guy to spend a little bit longer getting that light bulb fitted because it means they can actually charge a little bit more to the actual the asset owner. But the, the, the premise is is that we can walk into a room with BIM, we can pick up a, an iPad, we can go around the room, we should be able to see whether there's a cable running down that wall. We should be able to look up above and see whether or not you've got pipe work above you. Um, sprinkler systems. Um, and uh, it just means that it's, it's all about information management. So design, this is what happens at the minute. We've all been there, yeah? The architect sends something down to the construction manager and then the construction manager sends it off to uh, the structural engineer and it just all pings about and nobody knows which is the, the latest drawing and it's, it's mismatched and that's when errors occur. But what BIM tries to do is this. The model's in the middle. And it's all about collaborative working, that we, we have a common data environment, one place where all the information is stored, that we all put into that one place. And we can all pull from that one place so that there aren't as many errors. How many times have you been in the construction game where you've got to the end of a job and it's snag after snag after snag, and there's more money and more money and more money and Carillion have gone under? Yeah. 
So common data environments. The key elements are the fact you have work in progress. It's then pushed into a shared area where it's checked. Um, it's then authorised. It's then, has, then a published document, and everybody agrees with it, and it's then archived. And that then becomes the common data where everybody stores in the same place, hopefully, using the same file naming conventions. Key methods of uh, sustainable design are understanding climate culture, um, building types, building consumption, free local resources, efficient main man-made systems, applying renewable energies, which I used to be in, um, but BIM provides better accuracy over traditional methods. So, by reducing requests for information, which happens far too much, you don't need requests for information. If you've got the information in the right place, you can go to it yourself. When you ask for that information, it's then ambiguous and it comes out wrong. So, rework on site is reduced dramatically. So the Egan report said within it, production information is generally incorrect, incomplete, uncoordinated, and ambiguous. What does that mean? It means that things like this happen. Yeah? I mean, it's not a real picture, but, you know, it's where things are supposed to meet in the middle and they just don't because information hasn't been exchanged properly. Information is uncoordinated. We get things like this. I, I, it happens. I've seen it. Um, or like that. That could be a sprinkler system, couldn't it? <laughs> oh, that is a sprinkler system. Yes. No. <laughs> um, or like this. What's that? Somebody said a soccer ma soccer pitch yesterday. It's not a soccer pitch. It's a, it's a pitch. yes. Thank you. It's a football pitch. But what's wrong with it? There's nothing wrong with that, is there? But if you haven't got all the information, how could that look? <laughs> the ball boy at the bottom would be great getting that ball back up again, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, it, you have to have all the information. It has to be continuous. You have to keep that free-flowing information and make sure you're always up to date with the latest of everything. The biggest thing with BIM and what it, what it avoids is those, those ones there. Where are we? That one. It's called clash avoidance. They'd have had a 3D model on that job. Straight away, they would have seen that that would have happened. They go, oh, we can't put it there. We've got to put it just that little bit to the left. Imagine how the costs implications, let alone the structural issues with that, with that stanchion pipe that's <laughs> been chiseled out. Um, the the biggest and best part about BIM is the operation and maintenance. As Stuart said earlier on, um, you, all this information can be then kept in one place. Um, the amount of times I used to sell solar panels, I'd get to somewhere and they'd go, oh yeah, we've got our operation and maintenance manuals and they'd open this cupboard and they'd crack, crack out the, and they'd pull them out and they're all dusty and why? <laughs> it's madness. It should all be in one place on a, you know, on, on a big um, on a big computer that you can you literally go in, put, put in your, the right file name and you should be able to pull up the right information and it should be the as built. I can tell you now that there's a lot of times when we've gone, look, I've been gone, looked at those O&M manuals and they're not as built drawings or they're, they're, they're what they think are as built drawings but then when we go to fit something else on the roof it's not as it's stated in those drawings. So it's something called COBE, which I didn't mention last night, which is a construction operation building information exchange. Um, and that is about keeping that, that information so it is available for future people to take on that building. There's one FM company, they take it over, should be that same information. They shouldn't have to then regurgitate and find all that information out again. But it happens time and time again. So BIM and the BRE, so we are all about BIM. We've got an actual BIM department, um, so we, we can assess, advise, um, educate, which is where my department comes in. We can certificate the company and the individual, um, and then we, we do a lot of research on BIM as well, and we 
plough into a lot of the standards. The standard that this is that BIM's been all about has been a, a push for a, a British standard, and it was originally started as a PAS 1192. That's been going to be superseded by the end of this year by an ISO standard um, called uh, 19650. Um, so by the end of the year, there will be an actual standard that we can move to. A lot of the um, healthcare um, have embedded BIM within their structure. Um, and you, it, all public projects are supposed to be done under BIM. I hasten to add they, they don't tend to be. Um, what you also will find over time is that a lot of the local authorities will ask for certification of the contractors that they've been certificated and got a stamp to say that they are BIM compliant because there's a lot of people that aren't. They don't know what it is. They just think it's a 3D drawing. Okay, so we, we can help with that. We can come in, we can assess a business. And this isn't a sales pitch, I can tell you. We can assess a business, we can look at a gap analysis, and there are other companies that will do this, like the BSI. Um, we will then can train, certify individuals, and certify the company itself. Um, Cost-wise, training can be anything. You can do an online training on BIM that can take you through for certification for as little as £500. Um, you can do it at classroom courses that we can come in-house to you, or you, well, you can come to us at Watford. And we've also now uh, an approved training organisation for the CITB. So if you're paying to the CITB levy, we have a £70 um, BIM for Site Managers course that's online. You can buy that course and you can get all of the money back from that course from the CITB levy. Um, why wouldn't you send it out to all your site managers? Um, let alone just to, so they can understand what, what, when somebody said this is a BIM job, what it actually is. Um, we, we also have a, one for clients, so for asset owners. So if there's any of your, your clients you think, right, well, they need to know what, what it's all about, we've got training for them as well. Um, we soon will have one for manufacturers. We've also got an approved graduate scheme um, where we actually um, embed BIM within uh, a part of their, their learning process. So and for individual certification, we have two, two roads, either a certificated practitioner or uh, an informed professional. The certificated practitioner is somebody that's using BIM on a daily basis and can prove that he's used it and used it in projects. Informed professional is like upper management, somebody that doesn't use it on a daily basis but is informed to the level that they need to be. Um, the certification of companies, you're talking an average of around £10,000 over a three-year period to become certificated. Um, there is asterisks on the audit side there that's because of the fact that it depends on how many offices you've got and how many people you've got because the the actual amount of audit trail is can be can be bigger and smaller but that's the minimum amount you'll pay so thank you very much if you do have any questions for me um on top of the bim training that we do we obviously do an awful lot of uh bream training so we have bream awareness bream um uh ap courses um, and we also have a lot of fire door courses. So we have fire door inspection training, fire door um, maintenance, and we have fire stopping and compartmentation. If you're interested in any of those courses, please come and talk to me during the break. Thank you very much. And my question is, how do you feel BIM can give assistance to fire protection? Yeah. To make <coughs> sure no errors an installation occur, have 3D information post-installation, and maintenance of equipment is easier as information is more accurate. Thank you very much. Thank you.